Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we'll be taking a look at the classic Dungeons & Dragons adventure, The Isle of Dread. Written by Dave Zeb Cook and Tom Moldvay, the adventure first appeared in 1981's Expert Rules, which was for basic D&D and not to be confused with Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, a point that I found pretty confusing back then and how we ended up running this adventure in the first place, because we thought that Expert meant Advanced, and uh, we were 13 at the time and the Internet you know, wasn't around yet, so whoops. In 1983, it was reskinned and re-released with better artwork in the updated Expert box set. The adventure was the first appearance of the Mistara campaign setting, though at the time it was only referred to as the fantasy world or just as simply the continent. In 2004, Dragon Magazine number 114 updated the adventure and re-released it for third edition, now setting it in the world of Greyhawk. 4th edition changed the island's location again, this time to Feywild, and 5th edition's Dungeon Master's Guide mentions that the island is located in the elemental plane of water, but moves back and forth with the material plane. All of this to say that Dungeon Masters can place this island in whichever world that they wish, because it clearly does not matter. In 2018, Goodman Games released it and updated it for 5th edition in a 328-page hardback, making this 10 times longer than the original scenario was. Now, because there are multiple versions versions across multiple editions, which Expert Basic is even counted among the five editions that D&D even admits to, which that's a topic for a different day. Anyway, because there are multiple versions across four decades, I'm only going to discuss the original X1. Yes, most of this should apply to the other versions, but I'm only going to discuss the one that I played, which is available on Drive-Thru RPG, but not as a print-on-demand for some unknown reason. The original scenario was only 32 pages long, which is pretty impressive considering considering how much they crammed into it. It's intended for 6 to 10 characters, levels 3 to 6, or with 30 levels split up between them across the party. The adventure isn't as much of an adventure module as it's a campaign, you know, not only giving us a lot to work with, but also, very importantly, all the tools that a dungeon master needs to fill in the further details. It was the first wilderness adventure and the first hex crawl. In 2004, Dungeon Magazine listed Isle of Dread as number 16 in their 30 greatest adventures of all time list. Hold on, didn't we already cover this list when we did our review for Dwellers of the Forbidden City and why that adventure shouldn't have even made it on this list? True, Dwellers of the Forbidden City ranked 13 on that list, which was also written by Dave Zeb Cook. I find that unfortunate because Isle of Dread does everything that Forbidden City wanted to do, but better. Uh, both of them are pulp inspired, uh, Forbidden City pulled from Conan's Red Nails, while Isle of Dread is more King Kong and Conan Doyle's Lost World, though I prefer to see more Seventh Voyage of Sinbad in it myself, but that might just simply be my own projections. Both adventures feature lost civilizations, crumbled empires, tropical environments, native tribes, and give us some new monsters. However, while Forbidden City only hints at a larger world with rival nations, Isle of Dread gives those to you. It provides information about the tribes, about the world itself, and how to incorporate them, as well as the tools to make NPC personalities. Isle of Dread is a fantastic toolbox and was massively influential on me, as well as thousands of other novice dungeon masters, and I find this adventure to be far are superior. However, there is still quite a bit of room for improvement here, so what I'm going to do is offer my tips, my suggestions, my praises, and my criticisms as a dungeon master who has not only run this adventure, but ripped it off and stolen from it on countless others. And I'm Jack the NPC. I'm here to give it to you from a player's side of things as I get to relive the first of my many, many experiences traveling to remote islands, discovering lost civilizations, and fighting dinosaurs. And seriously, how many times did you rip this adventure off? I think I just described my entire 1992 through 1997 there. A lot. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, please stop here. But send your dungeon masters this way to see about running the adventure for you. But if you keep going and you spoil yourself, you'll be fed to the island's monster. 
Okay, Dungeon Masters, let's do this. The adventure itself is broken into four sections. The first is simply about the world setting. We get a two-page map, each hex equaling 24 miles, making this thing over 1,700 miles high. The upper portion is the continent, with the Isle of Dread down near the bottom. The continent includes short descriptions for 15 regions or nations, which is pretty cool that they put that in here. Uh, some are clearly analogs for real-world cultures, such as Vikings, Mongols, or Arabia, but others are more fantastical, you know, such as you know, non-human kingdoms. There's a dwarven one and a halfling one. My favorite of these being the Principalities of Glantri, which is a majocracy, meaning that the princes and princesses who rule it are all high-level magic users who are also rivals with one another, and they're operating in sort of an uneasy truce in this nation. We also get information about the weather and climate, as well as suggested pronunciations, which is pretty cool that they actually put pronunciation guides in here. I wish more supplements did that. I also appreciate that it says that there's suggested pronunciations. Uh, that way, when I inevitably butcher one of them and one of the commenters posts some sort of, you know, rage-fueled manifesto about how, once again, I mispronounced some completely made-up fantasy word, I can point out that those pronunciations were just merely suggestions. Are they still giving you crap for saying Baravia four years ago? Always. Regardless, as interesting as this world information is, none of this is essential for the adventure itself. So, uh, Dungeon Masters, if you do have your own world where your campaign is set in, you can feel free to use that world instead. But I do find this to be a really cool resource for DMs to either use if they don't have a setting that they're using, or just steal some really cool ideas from when they're making up their own setting. The adventure opens with the weirdest and most random means that I've ever seen in a tabletop adventure. Essentially, the player characters have found a bunch of blank papers on a recent adventure. However, on their way home from the adventure, they were caught in a rainstorm and all their papers got wet. Oh no! Because good parchment is expensive, they tried salvaging all these wet pages by spreading them out before a fire to dry. Then, to their surprise, a player's map appears on the heated pages, as well as a secret message telling them of some sort of fantastical island with a lost treasure. Holy crap, guys, we just hit the jackpot here. It looks like those scrolls that we found were really the log of some ship's captain, but he had written on them in lemon juice, so it's a good thing that we heated them up by the fire, because, you know, that totally sounds like something we would have done. Anyway, it talks here about some sort of island of dread and some sort of ancient and advanced civilization and all sorts of treasure, including a black pearl that it mentions several times, so you know that thing has got to be important. Anyway, we have got to go check this place out. Dungeon Masters looking for prettier versions of these handouts can find them with a little Google Foo. Uh, these came from the 1983 edition, and there's also some fan-made ones you can find. I recommend you maybe give this letter a distressed look, you know, maybe tea stain it, or give it some sort of, you know, cool feel like it's an actual artifact that you hand to your players. Of course, if you are going to be setting this adventure in a world that is not this one in the adventure, you're going to need to redo this letter to have all the appropriate names for the different cities and the different nations. The player character should hopefully be intrigued by this, and if they decide to gather some rumors, they can discover a little bit about this ship captain who died 30 years before, but you also might want to add some you know, rumors about you know, this strange island that sailors have seen you know, a thousand miles away. The next thing that players are probably going to need to do is secure their own ship to go down here. The module gives us a few options for this, such as getting a loan from a wizard, which, man, they better pay that guy back or it gets nasty. Or maybe they could split the treasure with a ship's captain who might take them down there. Or they could just purchase a really crappy used ship that's got all sorts of, you know, janky problems because they bought a used ship. Personally, I suggest that Dungeon Masters first run the adventure The Sinister Secret of Saltmarsh, uh, which is not only my, one of my very favorite AD&D scenarios, but it's specifically designed for low-level characters. Lower level than this adventure, so you could do this one first, and it ends with the player characters acquiring their own ship, or at least the potential for them to acquire their own ship. So, you know, maybe the player characters, they do that adventure, and they find that map and the log on those papers, you know, some sort of secret cache that they find in the house, or somewhere hidden on the ship itself, and you know, now they can go sailing off for this lost treasure in their own personal former pirate ship, which I think that would be pretty freaking awesome. After a long voyage, which should include some possible storms or other encounters like that, the player character should reach the island. 
Now, while the module says that the player should reach the island despite any hazards that they find along the way, that doesn't necessarily mean that the ship makes it to the island as well. So maybe the ship wrecks and they end up getting washed ashore like Robinson Crusoe. Or maybe the ship does make it all the way to the island, but it is so beaten up and battered at that point that it ain't going anywhere else for a long, long time. We get a map of this island with each hex representing six miles. Again, there are a lot prettier color maps out there that dungeon masters can find. While the interior of the island isn't visible from a ship that's sailing around the coast, I say that the player character should still be able to make out the giant central plateau at the island's heart. And when going with the King Kong theme here, I also say that you say the island is you know shrouded in some sort of you know ring of fog, you know, kind of giving it that supernatural or magical feel to it, but also limiting the visibility until you know they're right up on this island. You know, maybe they have to do a check to avoid some sort of rock or reef you know, kind of emerging from the fog before them. The island is a hex crawl, so the player characters are going to need to explore this island to see what all is there, and the visibility of what each hex contains requires that they at least get into the hex beside it in order to see what's inside that hex. Meaning that exploring this island can take a very long time and a lot of overland travel. The map is broken into four regions, each with their own wandering monsters. I like that there's regions for the wandering monsters rather than, you know, just the whole island using the same table. Honestly, I'd have liked it if they'd given us one or two more here. Now, the story, which is more alluded to rather than just straight out explained inside the adventure, is that the Island of Dread was once home to an advanced civilization, but is now populated by these primitive tribes that are descended from those people. Now, this ancient civilization, they were mind controlled by a race called the Kopru, which we'll get to those things later, but it never really spells all this out as far as what the island's history is. It's never all in just one place, and dungeon masters are going to have to kind of piece this together and kind of, you know, figure out some of the details and make those links themselves. So my theory here is that the Kopru Empire was housed in the central plateau, you know, as well as some of the other volcanoes that were around the islands. And the humans were the mind-controlled servants who actually built everything. Then after a revolution or maybe some sort of you know, cataclysmic event, most of the Kopru were killed and the humans' minds were freed. But now that they were separated from the minds of the Kopru, they couldn't remember how they did and how they built all this stuff in the first place. You know, uh, and, you know, maybe they were never even allowed to taught how to read and write, so they weren't able to pass that down. And as you know, generations you know went further and further, more of that technology was lost and slipped away. So now we're left with these primitive people that are living there, and the land ended up being reclaimed by all these monsters. And you know, that's how we got to where we are at the present day. Dungeon Masters, you can go ahead and do this history however you want to do it, but I feel it would give much more of a sense of, you know, discovery and wonder if the players are uncovering and piecing all of this together as they're exploring it and kind of finding out what the island's history is. Uh, so in order for them to do that and get the most out of it, you as the Dungeon Master need to know what the island's history was, that way you can drop those little hints like that that the players can all piece together. Oh yeah, Dungeon Masters should totally run with this and add all sorts of relics and artifacts all around the island. You know, maybe broken statues that are beside ancient highways or aqueducts that the player characters can barely make out now. You know, carve up entire cliff faces to look like crumbling temples, or maybe broken statues, and have ruins. Ruins everywhere, and not just on the main island, but on all the islands. You know, have some sort of building, a village, a port, or something like that. Dungeon Masters should make a map of what this empire used to look like back in the day during its height. And then, as the players are exploring this island and seeing what it looks like today, as they're discovering those parts of it, they're kind of piecing it together and figuring out what this place used to look like back in the day. While the natives don't have much use for gold or anything like that, there is gold treasure that can be found on the island. Most of that's going to be in jewelry or in idols, but they are going to find a few gold coins and well, you know, some of the, the monster stashes that they got. So go ahead and say how these coins, which are also relics from this fallen empire, you know, they might show you know these inhuman kind of tentacled face creatures on them. So have it that even finding treasure includes hints of the much larger past of this island. You know, uh, not just with this odd coinage, but maybe they find the coins and they were uh, stored in these old jars or vases and you know painted on the side were these uh, old maps of what the island used to look like back in the day or you know different scenes of different religious ceremonies that way everything they find is kind of you know kind of building on this history that the PCs are uncovering 
Okay, now back to these wandering monster tables. A couple things here. First, the peninsula is where all the natives live, and the whole population here is only 2100 people. But there's a lot of lycanthropes among them. It just seems a little bit extreme given what the total population here is, so I'd go ahead and trim that down and not have that many lycanthropes here. Next, once we get deeper into the island itself, we have a lot of dragons. Uh, one of the numbered encounter locations on the island is a green dragon's lair, but that green dragon is a very old one. These wandering ones are not. So I suggest that dungeon masters, before you run this, go ahead and choose where the lair locations are for these other dragons. And you can have them be on one of the smaller outlying islands or, you know, place them wherever you want. But go ahead, you know, establish where those layers are and where these dragons live. That way the player characters can try to find them. You know, maybe they can uh, do this at the request of some of the natives, you know, because this uh, black dragon, you know, swooped in and stole some of their people or some valuable artifact of theirs. And now the player characters have to go looking for this dragon's lair. According to the captain's letter, the main island shoreline is rocky and has no beaches. So the safest place for the PCs to land is the southern peninsula, which means we should meet these natives that the captain had spoken of. There are seven villages here. The module names them all, but doesn't specify which of these cities are which. A later map, starting with the 1983 one, did go ahead and note which village has which name. So game masters, if you are using the 1981 version, go ahead and note before the game which village is which before you run this, you know, that way you've already got that ready and at the tip of your fingers. Warriors from all seven villages help manning this giant wall that seals the peninsula off from the rest of the island, uh, which this thing is straight out of King Kong. In fact, I would go ahead and add some different details to this, like, you know, some, you know, giant, you know, monster skulls that are actually on the edge of the wall, kind of like a warning to any of the others, you know, don't come here and don't mess with this, you know, right above the gate, you know. Also maybe have the top of this wall or the outer face just, you know, bristling with these giant spikes to keep anything from trying to crawl over it. Yeah, it always struck me as weird that King Kong never climbed over the native's wall. I mean, the guy climbed up the freaking Empire State Building and then the Twin Towers in 76, but for some reason that wall always stopped him from getting over it. So yeah, you know, maybe covering it with a bunch of 15-foot spikes That'd be one hell of a deterrent. Now I love these natives and I love these villages. I love everything about them. Each village is divided into four clans, so all of them share the same clans even though all of the villages are actually separate themselves. Uh, these villagers, they're not hostile, though you might have a little bit of fear or concern from them when the player characters initially arrive because the, they're dealing with a pirate problem they got going on, but We'll get to the pirates a little bit later. Uh, the society here, they're all matriarchal with a council that meets between the villages. And this is great, but the best part of all of this is the zombies. Each village is a zombie master who is in charge of the walking ancestors that they call them. Which what that means is that through animate dead spells, these tribes have these armies of workers that are zombies. So uh, all these undead, they do all the menial labor around here, such as you know, clearing the jungle away from the big wall or just, you know, basic manual labor. Oh yeah, in a fantasy setting where magic is real and the fantastical is just a thing that happens, a lot of authors don't take into account how that magic and fantastical elements should just be altering the everyday lives of the people that are living inside of it. They always give us some sort of generic, medievalish setting that doesn't seem all different from the real world. However, the natives on this island, they have taken full advantage of the magic that they got. So now they got this army of undead workers that are doing all their menial labor for them and making their own lives a whole lot easier. So yeah, it might seem a little weird and creepy to an outsider that comes in here and is all like, oh my god, what the hell is wrong with you people? You're strange. But you know what? These natives are using what they got and using their brains to make their lives easier. And that puts them ahead of the curve. Not only are these natives friendly to the player characters, but they're also wanting to open up some trade routes to the outside world, which means that the player characters have the opportunity to become traders, which I find really cool that they put in there. You know, so many adventures are you know more based on you know trying to go to a location and killing the big bad thing and taking all of its stuff, but this adventure gives us the opportunity for the player characters to become a business. You know, you know maybe becoming merchant lords one day, or at the very least, be able to earn a ton of class out with these natives because they're the ones that established all these trade routes for the first time. Most of the module is about exploring the island itself. It is populated with tons of monsters, especially dinosaurs or giant animals, but we also have cat people who ride saber-toothed tigers, uh, these intelligent spell-casting giant spiders that have hands, uh, the phantons, which is kind of this Ewok village with these monkey, raccoon, flying squirrel creatures. There is a ton of cool stuff here. Now many of these places we do 
get maps for. The module even offers us a couple generic maps that DMs can use for any layers or anything as they need them. Once again, all of this is great that they provided all this detail. The biggest issue with many of these set encounter locations is that nothing really sends the player characters to those locations. You know, they're just kind of there in case the PCs stumble across them, uh, such as the pirate layer. And this one is on one of the side islands. We have a whole encampment of these slaver pirates. But once again, nothing sends them to this little island where they are, so I suggest you give the player characters a quest. Maybe one of the villages has been recently raided by these pirates, you know, either before the player characters arrive, and you know, so the PCs have to go save these villagers in order to build rapport with the tribe, or maybe this happens after the player characters have already met with the natives, you know, they, they meet them, they become friends with them, they go through the wall, they explore the island, they come back for a bit uh, to do their resupply and everything, and they discover that the pirates attacked while they were gone, and uh, now some valuable religious artifact is stolen, or maybe an NPC friend of theirs was kidnapped, and that NPC is in need of a rescue. There are two spots that send the player characters off to a specific location. In the rock's nest, they can find a map that leads to a treasure at location 19, which they're only going to find the treasure if they come there with armed with the map, so that's cool. I like that. It also makes a good opportunity to give the player characters a partially filled out island map that they discover with it. Uh, maybe a partially filled out island map of what the island used to look like back in the day, but at least shows them, you know, the terrain and what features might be found in those hexes if they haven't explored those hexes yet. Then there's another where the PCs must save a mortally wounded native, and he offers them a 50 gold piece nugget of platinum if they agree to bury them, and you get to choose which location that lady wants to be buried at. Which that's a really cool way to send the player characters to some specific location that you'd like them to go to, or you know, just directing them to go a certain way if they're kind of I maybe mean, rushing to the end a little bit too fast. Except for the part where this is Dungeons and Dragons and we got healing spells here. In a fantasy setting where a cleric could just heal up whatever is ailing this guy, it kind of seems a bit weird that he's lying there mortally wounded and asking the player characters to bury him. So you might want to change it to where it's not actually physical injuries that are killing him, but you know, maybe some sort of disease or maybe advanced age, and that's why he's dying. So he's gone over the wall and he's gone deep under this island so he can kind of lay down and be buried with his ancestors. So you know, he ended up getting lost and getting attacked by this dinosaur, but that doesn't change the fact that this guy don't have much longer to live, so he's asking the player characters to carry him the rest of the way. Which kind of does make him a lazy bum when you think about it, because if he stayed back home with his own village, you know, they were going to animate his corpse and turn him into a worker to benefit all the people, and he's all like, screw that, I'm going back over the wall and fighting dinosaurs because I'd rather get eaten by a dinosaur than be your worker for the rest of eternity. So. He kind of was taking advantage of a system that he benefited from but refused to give back to. Eventually, the PCs should make it to the plateau at the very center of the island. Now, this thing is 3,000 feet high, and there's only three ways to get the top of it. Uh, they can fly up with some magical spell or magical device. Uh, they can try to climb the cliff faces themselves, but even then, most player characters don't have the climb skills, and it would require 30 checks for them to do this, making that near impossible, or at the very least, making it just a painful amount of rolling dice 30 times for 30 checks. Or they can cross a 300-foot rope bridge, which is there for some unknown reason. Seriously, who the hell is maintaining this thing? It never says why there is a rope bridge there and why that rope bridge is even still intact. So first, instead of it being a rope bridge, uh, maybe make this bridge an artifact from that ancient civilization that once lived here. You know, some kind of monumental feat of engineering of this giant bridge, this arched bridge that's going across it. Or, if you want to add more to the pulp and fantastic feel, uh, make this bridge be the bones of some giant monster, like in Red Sonya, where they have to walk across this monster's spine. The top of the plateau is pretty straightforward. We get some new wandering monsters. I would definitely add some more ruins up here, like, you know, all across this thing. You know, some ancient city that's, you know, crumbled under all the regular tremors that's up here. Uh, maybe you can even, you know, carve up and down the cliffs that's going around the surrounding caldera in the middle here. You know, just cover these things with carvings. You make them beautiful. Now, the most interesting thing here is they have an exposed vein of gold. So, in addition to trading, the player characters might get into mining. 
The cliffs around the caldera are giant, but it never says how high they are, just that the uh, very tops of them are covered in ice and snow, and using the handholds that are there, it takes 12 hours for the player characters to reach the top of this thing, and then 8 hours going back down inside the crater. First, I find this part just a little bit weird. I mean, this place is supposed to be the center of this ancient empire, but getting to the center of this empire is just about impossible to do. So if Dungeon Masters, if you don't want to make this, you know, a, a, a clear path to get there, you know, maybe we can do an unmaintained trail that was leading up there, but that's now crumbled away. Or maybe we could have a tunnel that's been carved straight through these cliffs that was, you know, leading to where the temple is. Uh, and you know, the entrance of that could be you know, carved in the face of, you know, some mouth of a big creature. And you can even have it where this tunnel has collapsed over the years. So, you know, the player characters get there, uh, maybe they get halfway through before they come across this wall of rock, and now they've had to fight some monster that's made its lair inside here, and then they end up getting to this spot that's been caved in, uh, meaning that they can't go that way, or maybe if they can, if they have a door for some engineers, then you know, it could take a lot of time to clear out this tunnel and pop out on the other side. Just add something that says that, yes, it is very difficult to get in the caldera of this volcano and this portion here, uh, but once upon a time, there was a much easier path to get through because there was a lot of traffic that had to go through here. At the bottom of the crater is a small lake with a tiny fishing village along the shore. Uh, the natives who have been trapped inside this crater for God knows how long now, they should see the player characters coming as they're taking you know, eight hours to climb down the cliffs in order to reach the lake. Now this tribe is pretty cool. I love that their chief is a stone idol who makes all their decisions for them. Now this is just a stone idol. It's not magic, it's not alive, it's just a freaking stone idol. But they also have a second chief, a less powerful one, who's called their talking chief. And this is the human who can uh, hear what the stone idol is telling him to do or interpret what it is for the tribe, but you know, he's totally not making it up. Now the second tribe that's down by the lake is a tribe of headhunter cannibals who've made their home inside the ruins of an ancient temple that's on an island inside the lake. Now apart from this King Kong wall, this is the only ruins that the module has for this ancient empire that used to have this island, which once again I say there should just be a lot of ruins scattered around this island of dread. Hold on, so we got two warring tribes that are living together inside the caldera of a volcano next to a lake, and each of those tribes is like 50 people tops. How in the hell have these tribes not murdered each other off at this point? Maybe both of those tribes just starved to death by now because it's not like there ain't much food in here, you know? Also, we got not much sunlight because of all these cliffs that are surrounding the place. It took me eight hours just to climb down in here. This pod makes no freaking sense to me. I don't know, this whole portion is my least favorite part of the module. You know, so much of the module feels like it's been very well thought out. You know, like, this part feels like it's just a bunch of stuff that was thrown together at the very end. You know, personally, I think if you're going to have the headhunters here, you should have it where they can leave the crater, you know, wreak havoc all across the island itself. You know, maybe they could go through a tunnel like the one that I mentioned earlier, but that tunnel, they fortified and they're protecting it. So now it's not an easy path for the PCs to get through. So the PCs, you know, might still want to go up and over the crater like the module's wanting them to do. Uh, but they can go out and they can hunt for food and they can hunt for heads. And, you know, uh, you can also have them be the ones that are maintaining that giant rope bridge. So if you want to keep the rope bridge, so they could have it where they control this tunnel and the other tribe, the friendly tribe that the PCs can find, uh, they can't get out of this crater because they can't access the tunnel. So, you know, they're trapped in here on the shores of this lake. And that just makes a lot more sense to me. It also gives the opportunity for the player characters to come in and kind of liberate this friendly tribe from the evil one, which means that they can now finally leave the, the caldera of this volcano and get to interact with the rest of the people this island. Now the temple itself is pretty cool. I like it a lot. I like that there's secret rooms that the headhunters haven't discovered. I like the secret viewing rooms and the theatrics that the ancient priests can employ. This is actually a really cool ruined temple here. It's got a lot of ideas that I stole for other adventures. We also get to discover a statue of a Kapru, which is the first hint of what this adventure is, you know, what they really looked like. And, you know, these are the creatures that once ruled the island. I feel that Game Master should have hinted at these things all along but the images of the statues or, you know, on the coins and everything that they found, you know, maybe they're all weathered or defaced during the slave uprising. You know, the, the slaves, they went ahead and they smashed all the faces off these statues. So they've never actually gotten to see a good look at what they are. So until they find this, you know, idol and they're like, oh, well, that's what those things look like. Now, this idol is magic and anyone who looks at it must say versus spell or become a secret servant of the Kapru, which this is their ability that they use to control everybody. But this makes this idol a pretty dang 
scary artifact here, and this could easily lead to the whole you know, party of player characters falling under its spell, which means that might be the end of the campaign if everybody fails their saving throw. Now, player characters who do fall under this spell, they don't become mindless zombies or anything like that. They're just now committed to the interests of the Kapru as their only big motivator, which the Kapru, they want to rebuild their empire. However, the charm description also goes on to say that they get a new saving throw every month. So, Dungeon Masters, if you have it where the whole party fills their saving throw against these things, uh, you could have it where they come out of this like a month later, you know, and then, you know, they kind of kind of wake up and they come out from underneath the spell. And now the PCs have to undo the damage that they caused during their time that they were enslaved, you know. So uh, maybe they've now, uh, cap the Kapru have gotten out and they've, you know, captured more of the people around the island and they've done all this stuff. And now the PCs come out of it, you know, now they're like, oh my God, what have we done? And they have to undo all that. And that can, they can leave it to a, a pretty cool way of doing it. And that way you don't have to you know, turn these into NPCs and start up a new campaign or maybe you have to go kill the old PCs or you know, set their minds free. You could just fast forward in time as the PCs realize and kind of to their own horror what has happened because they failed their saving throws versus this thing. The next level down is flooded and it's evidently been sealed off for many years. I dig the fact that opening some of these doors can cause a rush of water that can sweep the player characters through it. I find that really cool that the water itself, you know, isn't just a hazard of trying to cross through it, but open the wrong door and you might, you know, suddenly cause all the water to rush somewhere else. However, the amount of creatures that are living in here seems a little bit high to me. It mentions that we've got some eyeless fish, but then there's, you know, giant piranha in one area, then there's some mako sharks in another. That seems like a lot of aquatic life to be living in a bunch of five foot deep water and a quarter acre worth of space that's been its own closed environment. So it's not like it's getting fish from anywhere fresh here. So at the very least, Dungeon Masters, you might want to change these, you know, sharks and the piranha into less recognizable creatures. Like, you know, maybe some sort of, you know, eyeless cave squid or some sort of, you know, giant aquatic worms that, you know, live inside the volcano and they've grown to giant proportions in here and they're feeding on the fish. Uh, you can keep them, you know, the same armor class, and the same damage, but, you know, just simply, you know, change what you call them and what you describe them as and make them, you know, totally new monsters that they find. Eventually, the PC should discover the final room where the last two Kapru are lurking in the boiling mud beneath the ruins of their once great empire. Now, these things are tough and their charm ability is pretty formidable, but I find them pretty underwhelming as bad guys. I mean, they're just sitting here in this final room, right? Just waiting for the player characters to show up and kill them. They're not doing anything. So I think it would just be a lot more interesting if uh, maybe you have it where these two Kapru are protecting a clutch of eggs. And these eggs, maybe they take centuries before they're ready and they're mature and they're about to give birth to a new empire of these things. Or maybe you have it where the Kapru are not sealed off from everything. You know, maybe they've been influencing the outside world somehow. Like maybe the headhunters themselves are actually mind-controlled servants of the Kapru. And you know, the headhunters, they go out and they capture somebody and they bring them them back here uh, to the Kapru so the Kapru can take them over. Or maybe they show them one of the magical idols and either the victim becomes you know, enslaved and a charmed and joins this tribe to serve the Kapru or if they make their saving throw and they resist it and then the, they're going to be eaten and have their heads cut off and shrunken down and kind of shown around to give everybody else the fear. I think that would be really cool if you did it that way. So now you have it where killing these two Kapru then frees the minds of these enslaved headhunters and the headhunters sort of come out out of it and they realize that you know they're not actually cannibals themselves they were just kind of forced to live this way that'd be pretty cool but to follow that up what if the Manchu tribe, that tribe that's got that stone idol that serves as their chief, what if that idol actually has magical powers and it kind of serves as the anti-chom against the Kopru's chom spells, right? So now, this little village of maybe 50 people, they're really the last line of defense against the Kopru Empire's return because they have this chief that keeps them from getting under the spell. Love it. Or you could have it where one of those islands that's around the island of Adred, you know, it's got some ruins on it. And one of those Kapru idols is inside the ruins. And then one of the factions, like, you know, one of the, the tribes here, or, you know, maybe the pirates, you know, they're just some normal sailors. They stumbled across this one day and, you know, they found this idol and now they're all mentally enslaved. And now they're doing, uh, what they're doing is, you know, gathering more people and they're showing them the idol to bring them under the Kapru spell. So, uh, you know, now the player characters, they have, they're kind of in a race against time, you know, trying to get to the main temple before the pirates are going to amass their numbers and set their masters free. And, you know, that gives it a little bit more of a desperation to it than the PC is just having all the time in the world that they want to explore this island. 
also much more interesting. But one thing I gotta know, where in the hell was that black pearl at? What pearl? The legendary black pearl from the captain's journal, the whole reason we came to this island in the first place? I searched the Coper's Leia but never found it. Oh, well that was down on the sunken level, there was this giant oyster down there that was just hanging out, and if you looked inside this giant oyster, it held a 3,000 gold piece black pearl inside of it. Wait, so the legendary black pearl that the captain learned about from those natives back on the peninsula, that was the pearl that was inside the oyster that was inside of a flooded room that wouldn't have been flooded when those natives' ancestors left there in the first place centuries ago? Yeah, that don't make no sense to me, that's gotta be wrong. There has got to be another black pearl here somewhere. Nope, that was the only one, which makes no sense at all. I mean, it'd be really cool if there had been a giant pearl, you know, maybe uh, that had been carved into that magic idol that they found. So the magic idol and all of the magic idols, if you want to have more than one, they're actually these giant black pearls. You know, the reason that there was that oyster in there that had that big one inside of it is they were growing it to make future idols in the future. Uh, so that's kind of a cool way of doing it, where the, the legendary item that they're going there to get is actually this thing. It might cause the empire to return. So you know, now they have to smash it or magically remove these charms from them. I really dig that idea. The module ends with several cool hooks and ideas for future adventures in the Isles of Dread, which I think that's a really nice touch that they added here. Uh, Zeb Cook did that as well for the Dwellers of the Forbidden City, but the ones here in the Isle of Dread just work better in my opinion. Either way, I love the adventure of addition hooks. If nothing else, it helps stir the Game Master's imagination of what else they can do with an adventure aside from just what's written inside the pages. We also get some tips for making inhuman encounters, whether those be natives or groups of adventurers, and then it gives us three sample adventure parties that we can grab and just drop in wherever we wish. And it's a really cool tool that the Dungeon Master can use to smoothly run this without having to stop the game and try to come up with a party of adventurers are. They can just, you know, grab this party of adventurers and keep going and keep the game momentum going. And I think that's a really nice touch that they added the generator, but as well as three pre-made parties. Overall, despite my complaints, I love love this module. It offers us quite a lot. It's a whole campaign in a very tight package. The majority of my complaints appear in the final portion of this module. I feel like they sort of shoehorned in kind of a random dungeon because they just felt that they had to have a dungeon for it to be a D&D adventure, but all of my complaints are pretty easy to fix if a dungeon master knows what to look out for and prepares for those accordingly. And with those, and with my other suggestions that I've made, especially about adding some more ruins and clues about the Kapru's history and the the Isle of Dread, this can make this a fantastic adventure. Once again, you can find it on DriveThruRPG, links down in the video description below. I suggest that you check it out. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews, or how to's, or tabletop war stories, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, heroes, you have a great day. You know, you had mentioned earlier how this adventure really reminds you of Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. And I get that, you know, we got Cyclops and rocks and a big green dragon, so that all makes sense. But one thing that that movie had that this island needs is a mountain stream that flows with wine. That'd be pretty freaking awesome. I mean, if my character found that, I would retire just right then and there. I'd be all like, guys, you go on without me. This is where I live. I'm going to build a house and I am never going to leave this place as long as I live. You know, maybe after a while, just sitting there next to my little mountain stream of wine, I'd probably stop bottling it up and try to sell it back on the mainland for a couple bucks. You know, Isle of Drink Cabernet or some name like that. <laughs> that would be pretty freaking sweet.